My name is uh, Chris Chavez. I'm the director of the Center for Latina, Latino, Latin American Studies. Um, the faculty grant program is one of the most important things we do. We help support uh, faculty in the research that they're doing. Uh, and it is really made possible through the help of faculty who go out and uh, review, vet these applications, deliberate. Uh, it's also helped with support of the uh, Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Uh, past grant recipients have gone on to study um, Aztec hieroglyphs, uh, microfinancing in Guatemala, climate change in Bolivia. So our work is, is really having a global impact. Uh, and today's speaker, Dr. David Meek, is uh, well within that tradition. So um, just a little bit about Dr. Meek, as many of you know, uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Global Studies and environmental anthropologist, critical geography, and food systems education scholar with an area specialization in Brazil and India. Uh, his talk today, uncovering the impact of rural school closures in Brazil, builds on its ongoing research in the region of Brazil, uh, where more than 28,000 schools have been closed within the last eight years. Um, Dr. Meek's focus is on this research is to understand how students, their parents and teachers understand the factors that are driving these changes and the effect that these changes have on agricultural livelihoods and ecosystems. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Meek. Thank you all so much for, for joining us for making it out here in person on this cold and rainy day. And just to you that are joining online, I greatly appreciate making some time uh, for today's presentation. And apologies for any confusion with a slight change of title. Um, the title of my presentation is Education in the Agrarian Question, a multi-sided analysis of Brazil's rural school closure crisis. Uh, and before I get started, I just wanted to give a big thanks to class for the faculty for the support uh, for this research. Without that support, undoubtedly, we wouldn't have been able to conduct the research. And for students that are attending, really strong recommendation to check out class's uh, website. There are other uh, funding opportunities, graduate student research grants, as well as undergraduate awards. Uh, in addition to that uh, financial support, there's also just a lot of really great programming coming through class. So strong recommendation to get engaged. All right, so I wanted to start by emplacing us a little bit, kind of putting us into some geographic context um, for this research and for why it matters. So the picture here is a confrontation between two different visions of development. And it's a social, these images are social artifacts of that confrontation. So we're in the municipality of Isailandia, in the state of Maranhão, on the edge of Brazil's eastern Amazon. Asailandia had once been denoted by the omnipresent acai trees, where here in the global north we get acai, uh, the kind of miracle berry. The name of the municipality, Asailandia, was a potent symbol of the fruit, the region's culture, and its vitality. But on a blisteringly hot day in January of last year, I walked around the relic of a school, Ozil Alves, which is pictured here below. With a hot wind blowing, I found that next to the school was a small separate cemetery. There were no signs of houses or any other indication that a community had existed there. The people had been making their lives there only five years ago. All of that was gone, all signs of life, cultural diversity of agriculture, all of that was gone and all that was left was a cemetery and the ruins of the community school. A juxtaposition that felt both highly symbolic and at once quite material. Surrounding the school was an expansive plantation of eucalyptus in the background and soy in the foreground, and that's pictured above. Surrounding the school was an expan this expansive eucalyptus plantation that went quite literally as far as the eye could see. There were no remnants of a community, just one person and one machine moving through the landscape. It was a vision that my research team and I saw advancing three weeks of field work in three separate states of rural schools closed and being surrounded by and materially encompassing agribusiness. For example, in this photo, and um, it might be a little confusing, this is actually two photos. In this photo, and here we see the outside of the school with the, the lock through the door, 
and then peering in through and one of these broken windows, we see the school, the, the, the edifice, the relic of the school being used as an animal uh, feed station, right? So literally the school coming on to encompass, um, com encompass agribusiness. So in today's talk, I'd like to kind of jump between scales, highlighting the very real crisis of rural schools at the national level, and then kind of drilling down at, to a finer scale uh, to explore the factors that are affecting the closure of schools and those that are resulting in spaces of resistance and social resistance to that broader school closure crisis. I'm going to start by providing some geographic and theoretical uh, context for the rural school closure crisis and then um, highlight the kind of the broader dynamics of phase one of this research, uh, which would involve a geostatistical analysis of the big data data set of rural schools and their closures. This is how we identified the case studies. Um, and then I'm going to transition to talking about um, providing the case study, uh, looking at some of the factors, again, that are resulting in the schools being closed, as well as the factors that are resulting in the schools remaining open. <clears throat> All right, and just a brief note on, in terms of how I came to this research. I've been working in Brazil um, with an agrarian social movement known as the Landless Workers Movement since 2009, for almost 15 years now. Um, that research is uh, had been ethnographic in nature. I conducted approximately two years of ethnographic fieldwork as part of my doctoral research between 2009 and 2013. Um, I continue to be engaged with, um, with this process, not just as a researcher, but as, um, as an ally, I guess I would say. Um, I serve as a member of the National Coordination of the Friends of the MST. This is a solidarity organization that works to support the MST uh, here in the U.S. and at a global level. Um, this project began long after I finished my doctoral dissertation. As I was reading kind of, you know, web articles and communiques from the Landless Workers Movement in which they were arguing that there was this crisis of rural school closures that was taking place and that agribusiness was one of the main factors that was, was kind of perpetuating this crisis. And so I became very interested in exploring what I was kind of understanding as this movement hypothesis, this interrelationship between agribusiness and the closure of rural schools. And so that's what kind of led to the origination of this project. Um, this project is one of a number of uh, research initiatives that I'm engaged in. Um, in a participatory fashion with uh, agrarian social movements, not just in Brazil, um, but really throughout the world. I don't work in India with other agrarian movements that are part of La Via Campesina, which is a, another broader movement that the Landless Workers Movement is part of. Um, and colleagues and I at Stanford recently just received a, a grant from the Spencer Foundation for uh, work over the next five years in Colombia, Nicaragua, in Chile also with agrarian social movement. So this, this is kind of one node of a much broader uh, research project. <clears throat> Quick note about our research team. Uh, so this was a collaborative project, um, the one I'm gonna be discussing today. It was a collaboration between myself and uh, two critical Brazilian agrarian geographers, Maria Malsana Fernandez and Ines Sobrero de Filho. Uh, Dr. Fernandez is kind of one of the founders of agrarian geography in Brazil kind of a really leading figure, particularly in his history of working with the Landless Workers Movement. Um, he's worked with the, the Landless Workers Movement since the late 90s. So really kind of a key a key uh, figure in that, those debates. And uh, Dr. Sobrano Filio is a, was a student of Bernardo's um, and is now at the University of Brasilia. All right, so let's see here. Over a period of three weeks, we conducted field work in uh, three states in the eastern Amazon. In we're missing a color here, um, but in Maranhão, Tocantins, and Pará, uh, in a set of municipalities, and these were municipalities that had uh, statistically significant high rates of rural school closures, and they were municipalities that um, we kind of focused in upon based upon phase one of uh, research project. So this research, as I mentioned, is with an agrarian social movement. It's a participatory research project alongside and working with uh, the Landless Workers Movement, the movement of this Trabajadores Flores Sintera, uh, which goes by the acronym of MST. So the MST is the largest agrarian social movement in Latin America, millions of members, 
Um, and the MST's main tactic is what we might call direct action land reform. And what they work to do is to identify parcels of land that are, um, they argue are not being used. And, um, or they might be being kind of used by, uh, or worked by slave labor or something along these lines. And so what the MST will do is identify these parcels of land and then uh, quite literally squat on them. They'll invade them. They'll set up these, um, these kind of temporary uh, communities known as encampments. These encampments might, they're temporary, but they actually might exist for years as the MST is kind of pushing the state to take that land to create a legalized community and agrarian form settlement. Okay. So the MST's real kind of goal is to get access to land for its members so that they can engage in sustainable agriculture. And education, in particular, uh, critical forms of ed education are, are central to this movement's ideals and its visions of social transformation. Now, in my broader research, I argue that education is a key way of understanding what we might call the agrarian question. So the agrarian question is a debate that Marxist and other critical scholars have been engaged in since the late 19th century. And the agrarian question, if you like boil down all of that kind of theory, what it's about is what's going to happen to the peasantry. Now, we don't really use the term peasant a lot in American English, but in many parts of the world, to be a peasant, it's an identity that has a lot of symbolic value, that has a lot of cultural context. And um, it's, a, it's an identity that's not, you know, something, you know, relegated to the dustbins of history, but it's active. It's something that people really identify with. So the agrarian question is really about, like, what's going to happen to the future of the peasantry? Are they going to be pushed off the land? Are they going to be kind of made obsolete? Or are they going to continue existing and resisting? And so in my research, I look at what's the role of education in terms of understanding the agrarian question. And what I essentially argue is that there's two ways of thinking about this, that education can lead to what we term depeasantization. It can re result in like creating negative spaces. It can, it can kind of uh, kind of homogenize space, push peasants off the land. And we might see this as uh, urban schools have more resources, uh, rural schools have less resources, families might send their children to urban contexts in order to get a quote unquote better education, right? That might result in the depeasantization of the countryside. But the flip side of that is that education can help create a space for the peasantry. It can help like kind of resuture and reconnect people to the land, particularly through forms of education that value rural lives and livelihoods. So one model of education, and this is a model of education that the Landless Workers Movement, the MST, has really been at the forefront of pushing, is known as Educação do Campo. And the Educação do Campo, we might translate as education from the countryside. But the way I think about it is that it's education of and for the countryside. It's education that comes from the rural realities, the rural demands of social movements, and it's related to those communities, right? Um, now, Edifice of the Grample, it's really centered around several main elements. One is the importance of an agrarian identity. So rather than uh, what we might call Edifice of Rural, like kind of the dominant mode of rural education in Brazil, which has this implicit curriculum that debases and uh, devalorizes rural livelihoods and identities. And the Pesante Campo really prioritizes and valorizes those, those forms of culture and, and livelihoods. Um, it's also a vision of education that's grounded in sustainable agriculture, or what we would call like agroecology. So it seeks to kind of create alternative livelihoods through diversifying agri agricultural systems, basing the design of the agricultural systems around ecological principles, such as uh, rotational grazing, intercropping, mulching, and so forth. And the ultimate end in one way of Edifice de Pampo is to advance what we might call food sovereignty or the community control over one's food system. And I just say that if any of this is interesting in today's talk, but particularly these kind of elements, I encourage you to check out. I teach a class on food sovereignty. We really get into depth about all of these elements, and it's uh, it's pretty cool. All right. So now, kind of moving from some of that broader context into into this question about the rural school closures. So the closure of rural schools in Brazil, it's both spatially extensive uh, in terms of across Brazil, but also intensive phenomenon. 
Um, in 2014 alone, more than 4,000 rural schools were closed by the state. Um, expanding that temporal scale, the, the Brazilian government maintains that in the last 25 years, approximately 37,000 rural schools have been closed. It sounds like a lot, right? I mean, 37,000 rural schools, that's a lot. What we found in our research, and this is research, this kind of first phase of the research, which we've been doing since about 2018, is that those numbers are way off, that it's actually 140,000 rural schools that have been closed, approximately 80% of rural schools in Brazil have been closed since the, since 2000. Um, and so we talked in some of our uh, papers that are just starting to come out about kind of how those numbers have been creatively interpreted, I would say, by the state, how they might, um, you have to really kind of get into the fine grain. I'm happy to talk more about this, the details of how they code the data, but a school might be basically like suspended for one year and then it becomes active again, and then it becomes suspended, and it kind of goes on and on in that process. But they're, they're essentially being closed. Um, they don't come back ever really into existence. And so we look at how the government has basically kind of manipulated the data um, to really greatly reduce the nature of the optics of the crisis. Um, so the kind of perspective that we take is that the closure of rural schools is an, ex is an explicitly spatial phenomenon. I mean, our research team is composed of kind of critical geographers. One of the kind of main policies that Brazil uses in terms of closing rural schools is called uh, nucleação or nucleation, um, which is kind of spatial and spatialized at its core. And the way to understand nucleation, and this is kind of looking at how schools get closed, is you might have like six communities. Each one has a, has a rural school, right? Um, what, the, what the government will do is it will take five of those communities and say basically like, you don't have enough students or your students have to travel too far to get to your local school. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna close those, you know, those schools and we're gonna send you to like a polo. We're gonna send you to like an urban center that has kind of like a larger school. So it's this really very geographic process of like closing schools in rural spaces and then busing students in um, or kind of just requiring students to figure out how to get to an urban school uh, to attend that other, that other context. Now, scholars argue that this process of nucleation is, is closely tied to the agrarian question. Um, Miguel Arroyo, um, for example, argues that this is all manifestations of a public policy that's really characterized by the modernization of agriculture. Now, what we have is this kind of competing uh, territorial visions of development, that there's this conflict between small-scale diversified agroecological farms on the one hand and kind of the territorial vision of agribusiness on the other. That this is a very uh, geographic phenomenon. All right, so the main research questions that we explored in the context of this research is what's the spatial nature of this phenomenon? Are the school closings concentrated in a particular area of Brazil, or are they more uh, evenly distributed across geographic space? What are the factors behind the, the closure of the schools? And how are local communities resisting? All right, so just to kind of go quickly through phase one of the research, this was the, you know, the geostatistical analysis. Um, what we did in, in short is created a big data data set, which is something I'd never done before. It's pretty cool, actually. But we gathered um, very fine grained data, data from the Brazilian educational census at the municipal level. And so it'd be basically like um, going through every one of Brazil's 5,528 municipalities and saying like, how many rural schools are there? How many rural municipal schools? How many rural private schools? How many rural state schools in say 2005 and then 2006? And if there were, you know, 100 in 2005 and 120 in 2006, like calculating the difference for every type of school, for every municipality over, um, let's see, 1994 to 2018, uh, 24 years, right? So like kind of creating this big data data set of all of these kind of dynamic changes in the school closures. And what we used is a combination of Microsoft Access as a database and then ArcGIS for doing the, the spatial analysis of those data. Um, 
Um, and I'll go fairly quickly through this, but methodologically what we did was something called hotspot analysis. And what hotspot analysis is, is it's basically like, you hear about this in terms of crime mapping. If there's like a, like a number of crimes in a community and you're interested in like, are this, you know, statistically likely to take place in a certain location, that's hotspot mapping. Um, what it does is it looks at the distribution of values, not just like high values, like where school, schools are being closed, but the relation between a, a community that has a number of school closures and ones that don't in order to figure out like, where are these hot spots of the school closures. And again, I'm happy to talk more about the, um, the nature of this data analysis uh, in questions. So in addition to the school closures, we gathered a number of data sets on other variables to explore like what might be driving this process. So we gathered data on literacy, uh, family farming, land structure, uh, race, and social presence. And what we found through in this first data phase, uh, phase of the research uh, using uh, geographically weighted regression analyses um, was that family farming and race were the two principal variables um, that had explanatory value in accounting for the school closures. And so the way to kind of interpret this basically is that if you are living in a community of color, if you're living in a community of color that relies upon sustainable agriculture or small scale subsistence agriculture, that there's a disproportionate likelihood that schools are gonna be closed in your community in comparison with another community that's not a community of color or a community that does not rely upon subsistence agriculture. So those were the most significant statistical findings from the first phase. Other explanatory variables included um, land structures, how much, what we would call like the Guinea land index, how much land is, uh, how, to what degree is land being concentrated in the hands of a few uh, corporations versus diversified throughout the community, and the presence of Edekusson, Dukan. All right, <clears throat> super quickly, um, just a few of the results from the analysis. What we found is these very persistent hot spots of rural school closure, principally in the Northeast of the country and in the North or the Amazon region. Um, and this makes sense if you kind of look at the literature on rural education, the history of education policy in Brazil, where um, these are broader regions that have been largely disinvested from by the state in terms of public policies. All right, so that was phase one, and that kind of really set us up for um, figuring out these case, you know, where do we want to do these case studies? Where do we want to like explore um, kind of the effects of these school closures on rural communities? So with class funding last year, um, I went to Brazil to join uh, Dr. Fernandez and Dr. Sobrero de Filio um, to engage in phase two of this research project, the qualitative data collection. Uh, we conducted three broader case studies in the states of Pará, Tocantins, and Maranhão. Uh, over three weeks, we did about 30 interviews, a um, few focus groups with educators and active, educators and activists, site visits to rural schools, both ones that had been closed, um, as well as sites of environmental exploitation, so mines and uh, large flies and endless. Uh, right. So that's kind of the, the basics of what what the research looked like. I wanted to just kind of go through some of the emerging, two sets of some of the emerging findings. And I would just note that um, this is a very much ongoing research process or data analysis process. We're using qualitative data analysis uh, program called MaxQDA to uh, engage in kind of the iterative coding uh, and analysis of the data, which is quite time consuming. Um, so the first set of central findings that I want to highlight are the ways in which processes of closure and resistance are interwoven and in conflict. And we saw this explicitly when touring schools that were still open. Um, as a footnote, one of the things that we, we realized is that like it was very difficult to kind of talk to folks in communities where the schools were closed. Because like, as I mentioned on the first the first slide, there was no one there anymore. When the school closed, there was like the community evaporated or the school closed because the community evaporated, like the, you know, the temporal nature of that depends on the, the context. Um, but in order to do this research, we needed to go to schools that were still open, right? In order to talk to people that were still there, basically. So what we uncovered more was like 
How do educators resist this process of school closure? And what does that process look like as it's in on the mental, like how's, as it's unfolding and ongoing? Um, so here what we have is, is two pictures from a library. Um, and what's, what's really interesting here is the way, what, what are the books and who's funding the books? I guess that's kind of the, the starting point I would, I would note here. Um, large agribusiness and mining companies are actively involved in the financial support of rural schools, and predominantly that's taking place through the provision of textbooks. So social movement leaders and educators highlighted that this was an explicit strategy of ideological invasion and what we might call territoriality, where the intentional efforts to control a territory through um, ideological means as well as force. So I wanted to read a few brief results um, from brief excerpts from our results. And this, uh, what I'm going to read comes from a social movement leader whose name is Deozinia, and she's a state level leader within the MST. And she told us that this space, our community, our school, it's being controlled by corporations. They're increasingly, the, the, the corporations are increasingly uh, encircling the school. And they're doing this because they realize that our school has a political vision, that it's grounded in a social movement that holds power. And so we as educators, we need to have a lot of strength so that our school isn't co-opted. Go check out the library and see what kind of books you'll find there. You're going to find ones that are financed by Vale. Vale de Hila Dulce is one of the largest mining companies in the world. The picture of the train uh, from the previous slide was from Vale's mines. Um, if you can see, it's probably difficult up here on the left hand side. It shows that this textbook is funded by the Fundação de Vale, the Vale's foundation. So the mine is literally buying and producing these textbooks and disseminating them in the communities. Coming back to Deozinha. So you can find Vale's books in our library, um, but you're going to also find books from Expressão Popular. And this is the, the press that is that the MST has within it, the movement itself. So the MST, the social movement, has its own press. They produce oh, like it's their own books. I'm actually looking at going to get one of my books translated to be uh, published by uh, this press as well. So in this, like the very small community uh, schools library, they have you know, all of these textbooks that are produced by Vali that they do use, but they also have the books from the movement. They have books on Marxism, they have books on agroecology, on gender politics, and so forth. All right, so she told me, it's like this. If you don't have a collective, a collective of educators that resists, for example, if we as educators aren't prepared to take these books and transform these materials in our own direction, to use these materials to strengthen our movement, if we're not prepared, well then, she kind of indicated that's like the end. That's the end of us. That's the end of our community. And so what she was getting at here is that these educators, what they try to do is they're, like, they're going to get these resources from, they come from the government, but they're funded by the corporations. They're going to get these textbooks, but they're going to use them. They're going to manipulate them as part of their own strategies of resistance. They're going to teach with them. Talk about like, why is our community, why is this municipality called Asylandia? Where are the acai trees? What's the history? How have these forests been deforested? Who's been doing the deforesting? What's happened in our community? So they're using these resources, but they're mobilizing them towards a very political purpose, right? And so this is her point, is that we need to be organized as educators. We need to work together um, to really keep our school alive and vibrant. So Dela I thought was pretty clear that the ideological insertion of Mali into the schools has significant impacts, both in the material struggle to keep the school open, as well as the very uh, interconnected ideological battle that the movement was waging. So Dela closed by telling me that we're trying to subvert the structure that comes through capital and agribusiness. In the ways that we're occupying the school with the pedagogy of the movement, we're trying to subvert the logic of capital, trying to subvert the logic of infrastructure and investment. Now, in our analysis, and then in kind of in my discussions with Dr. Fernandez and Dr. Sobera de Filio, what we've come to is that we understand the investment of agribusiness and mineral extraction firms in the schools to be a form of territoriality, to be a way in which organizations, corporations like Vale. Um, are occupying the territory of the school, that they're doing this by putting within the school the books that the corporations want. 
All right, and just one more uh, little data uh, result piece before I before I close and open it up for, for questions here. Um, speaking about the rates of school closures, and this is in another community, um, talking with an educator named Vandulan, who I'll call Vandulan. Um, he reflected that generally the schools that are being closed, these are in, as he was said, these little houses that have been, that have been abandoned, that are, they're now being used by schools. They exist within the territory of a large landowner. So what he's doing is kind of talking about why are certain schools closed? And it's the schools that exist on, in these communities where these large farms are. There are communities where you have a single teacher that works mornings and afternoons and does all the teaching as well as the administration. Those are the schools that are being closed. What Van Allen told me is that what we've experienced, not just here, but in other municipalities as well, is that it's difficult to close a school in a community where there's resistance, where there is this history. And maybe it's not the MST. Maybe there's another movement. Perhaps there's a union. Or perhaps that community is part of a, a quilombola, a descendant community of slaves. Or perhaps they're part of a different movement, like the movement of, of coconut breakers or uh, rubber tappers. If they have social organization, it's much more difficult for capital, for the state to close the schools. All right, so what Vanderland's really underscoring here is the importance of um, this form of social organization. Now, if they don't have a political project, if they think about education in the context of educação plural, this other vision of education, then it's much easier to close the schools. Those are the schools he's telling me that are being closed. So from our perspective, he argues that's a little more philosophical. The community has a fundamental role in the maintenance of the school. The schools that were closed, this is all Vanderland, the schools that were closed or were in the process of being closed were in communities that didn't have our history of struggle. So as we talk, the reason Vanderland saw his community as having a school, as having a school that remained open, was that the educators had worked together. They had worked together to keep the school open. They had all sorts of projects um, destined to try to kind of mobilize students, to mobilize community members. And Vandalon reflected that here, the closures are less in the, in around in our community, principally because we work to differentiate ourselves. We have a group of professors that are activists, will actively resist, will end up working to support our school and other schools in our region. He closed by telling me that with this type of work, many schools have been strengthened by the idea, the ideology of educação do campo, principally where the MST is active. For this reason, we haven't had big problems with school closures because there's been this resistance. What's key is an organized community. And so this was kind of a finding that we had again and again in our discussions with educators that it's really where there is not what activists would call a political project, where the community isn't organized, where they're not mobilized, where they're very like individual focus, those are the communities which are really in danger of the schools being closed. In Van der and other educators' perspectives, the communities that are able to keep their schools open are those that are mobilized, that have the forms of social organization necessary to quite literally resist and persist. All right. So just a few concluding thoughts. Um, these are ongoing processes of erasure of expansion, the expansion of agribusiness, the expansion of um, uh, mineral extraction in different regions. Um, but alongside those ongoing processes, and very, they're very much territorial processes of expansion, there's also kind of the concomitant processes of resistance that are taking place, that educators, that activists, that community members are working together to support schools, to support kind of the ongoing development of an alternative vision of education, um, the activists in Brazil, Chairman Ed Casandu um, That the, the material effects of these school closures are very significant. We're not just talking about um, you know, the loss of an opportunity for education, but really the cultural erasure of a community. And we saw this like again and again. And this is something that really surprised me. I thought we would be able to go and we find these communities that were still around, but like, you know, the school maybe wasn't there, but no, like every single time, I think we visited like 40 different sites of schools, because they're not schools anymore. Everyone, there's like, there's no houses, there's there's no one there. And it's been, the area around has been transformed. It's either a large farm or it's a mine or it's, you know, it's been expropriated for 
train tracks for a mine or something like that, right? Um, so there's this cultural erasure and territorial transformation. But at the end of the day, in Fanalis Clontus, like what's important is the organization. What's important is the movement's presence, because this is how people are coming together. This is how they're developing strategies. This is how they're learning from each other, socializing the, the, the ideas of how it is that we stay on the land, how it is that we learn from each other to, again, resist and persist. Um, and this photo here is from uh, one of the IALAs. These are the agroecological institutes of Latin America that are associated with the MST and this broader movement of La Vida Campesina. And with that, I would just say obrigado. And just, again, thank you to class for the support of this research. And uh, just open it up for questions. And that's, uh, that's me from a very long time ago. It's a different research class. <laughs> thank you a lot, John. Next are uh, questions from the audience. Yes. Well, Zina asked the first question. Yeah. Uh, if you could, and that's a sensitive topic, mm. uh, if you could uh, explain a little bit of the violence of mm. the process of these closures. Yeah. Because it's it's never mm. easy on the on the community, but the violence, the sheer violence of the process of closing these schools. And who perpetrates yeah. these closures? Thank you. I think would be very interesting. No, that's a that's a great question because I think it's easy to read from this that it's kind of like mm, it just happened in the background, right? Or there's not like actors. There's not actors that are that are engaged in the closures, but undoubtedly, like this is a violent process as you're describing. And I think we could talk about violence in this context in terms of structural violence, right? Um, and thinking about the ways in which particular communities are experiencing these closures. Um, so I guess I'd say that violence happens along a continuum, right? That we have particular context and I mean, even going back to Brazil in a few weeks um, to look at closures in a very different cultural context where that violence has taken like an incredibly visceral form where um, the state like arrived funded by agribusiness with bulldozers and basically just like level level like just completely leveled the school and, and bulldozed the community and it was like it was very intense eviction process and this is um in the south of brazil and the Quilombo campo Grande. um so they have violence like on that side and this is where it's like it's a little blurry like who's the who are the, are the actors here like who's the state like we think about the state as like the government but i think in many places in brazil one example if you see kind of these nebulous boundaries between the state um, and agribusiness and corporations, right? And like um, the actors who might literally be driving the bulldozers are the local fazenderos, right? Or they're the, you know, the local mining interests or something like that, right? They have the state support, but the police aren't gonna do anything, right? They, they, they might be there present, like formally evicting people out of their homes, but who's driving the bulldozers might be the local landowners, right? So it, it can be like that kind of like violence with like a capital V, but you might also have like this violence that I think is much more every day. And that's like the violence of like defunding and, neo and neoliberalism, right? And that's what we see in a lot of other contexts where one of the other sort of factors that I didn't really get into today was what we might call like the political economy of like transport. So one of the main ways that the state is closing these schools is basically arguing that like, there's no way for students to, to get from their very rural homesteads to the kind of the local um, the local school, that there's not a good enough bus service within that, within that community. And the reason is because the state's not funding the buses in the community, but what they are funding ironically is to take the students out of their communities and into an urban center, right? So it's this kind of like really perverse logic here. Um, but that I would say is another form of violence. That's kind of like this implicit violence of like, we're not funding buses, right? We're like basically cutting off the possibilities for getting to school. And as a result, cutting off like the, the lifeblood of a community as you send your children to an urban center. That's a great question. Thank you, Brad. There you go. Yeah, you know. um, I have a question. Um, so the, the way you explained it, there's um, the the communities that are successfully keeping schools from closing are have kind of a political project or organized um and you know perhaps aligned with mst or not um i'm wondering if they're other than like keeping schools from closing i'm wondering if they're like 
alternative success stories mm -hmm. as we see MST acquiring new spaces. Uh -huh. Are there are there alternative forms of education day compo that are, and I know this wasn't part of your research yeah. or what you were looking into, but I'm curious about, are there alternative forms of education that are emerging that are outside of the state mm -hmm. um, in those areas where MST might be growing or yeah. in terms of space? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, if, a few pieces there. One is like, the kind of the complicated relationship between MST and the state or movements in the state in terms of education provision. Because what these movements argue is that it's like really the state's obligation to provide education. So, and it's something that I thought and been somewhat critical of is that there's this real reliance upon the state for providing education. This is, this is coming back to your question because my question is like, why aren't there these experiments like what you're describing? I haven't really seen a lot of these kind of more autonomous spaces of education, kind of like you're asking. I haven't seen those sorts of examples and I've been wondering over the years in working in Brazil, like why is that the case? Why are there not like, why is the MST not developing schools like completely autonomously, you know, without having to rely upon the state? And I think it's this question about like dependency, right? Is like the relationship with and the relationship with the state that they, they perceive, and quite rightly, that it's the state's obligation to provide resources for education. And so, as a movement, what their goal is is like to pressure the state to fulfill its obligation. But then it creates this kind of complicated situation in which they're really reliant upon the state in many ways for those resources, and to have to jump through the hoops in terms of like you know, the quantitative assessment of, of students and like all the standardized testing and that sort of stuff. So the question of like autonomy and dependency in terms of movements in the state is, is, a, is a difficult one. Um, the experiments that I've seen kind of, and I don't know if they're really more autonomous, but just they do fall outside of this model um, that are different. They're not new. They're actually in Brazil, they're quite old. So there's something called like, um, the schools agricolas, like the, the agricultural schools, the schools familias florais, right? Like these different forms of schools, like family family rural schools, started in like the 20s and 30s and largely out of like relationships with the Catholic Church, which is really interesting in the history of Brazil. Um, and these are schools that I don't think have really been as susceptible to the school closures. They also do have funding from the state, but they're much, this, they're what we call like vocational schools, so like more tech schools. Um, but I think those have kind of weathered that, this particular storm a little bit better. And so it'd be interesting to look into like, what is it about those schools that have enabled them to kind of stay open? I think it might be that they're, they're almost based upon that nucleation model, but from the inverse, and I'm just thinking about this now, but like they're, their mandate is to pull from all of these different communities. So by definition, they're not trying to say like, you know, Lane County, you can only send us three students, that's not enough. They're trying to serve as an umbrella or like um, what you would call it, like a funnel for all of these different communities. So that might be how they're staying open is by kind of inversing that nucleation model. Yeah. Interesting. Angela, I have a question. Hey, first off, uh, great presentation and thank you for, for doing that. Um, just kind of a follow up on Fred's question earlier um, when you mentioned that there was maybe some sort of compensation for relocating students in the urban centers. Yeah. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. And kind of additionally, um, from the US context, I'm familiar with like mm -hmm. the main type of, you know, government taking loans mm -hmm. and providing money. Does that ever happen when they close the schools and people move out? Is there any compensation or is it just like this transportation? Piece? Yeah. So, and just for, for clarification, like they're not, there's no compensation for the students going to the urban centers. It's actually probably the opposite. That it's like, you know, your responsibility to get the kids to to the, you know, let's say Portland or something like that. It's really that far away, kind of like an hour or two away in many contexts. And so like, you know, you might have to, you've got a brother in Portland. Oh great, okay. So you're gonna send your kid, they're gonna go live with your brother. And they might come home on the weekends or like once a month or something like that. But it's like your responsibility to figure out like how they're going to do that and how they're going to survive. And so it's it's a real financial obligation for like these rural families, right? Um, and in many cases, it's a context that they just, it's not viable, right? They can't afford for their kids like to be going away, to not be able to work on the farm and so forth. So there's like some real kind of difficulties in sending one's children to like a urban context, right? Um, in addition, just like, 
kind of the, the breakage of like those rural linkages. Um, so there's not there's not funding. In some cases, and this is what I want to continue looking into, um, the state is providing busing services um, that would like a bus that would go to a number of communities, pick up like all of the kids and just take them to you know, take them to Salem, take them to Portland or whatever it is, and bring them back at the end of the day. But it's like, you know, and I've got narrative, we've got other interviews about this. It's, it's like just so sad. It's like, you know, people saying like, we'll spend three or four hours on the bus a day. Like we get to school, we're exhausted, but you know, we don't have food, there's not great food there or something like that. It's a very different cultural reality. People are like looking down on us, being like, you know, you're a Sandeha, like you're these kids that come from like that, like poor landless, you know, community or something like that. So there's a lot of like um you know, prejudice and ostracization that's happening. And so, you know, then we can go to school and we come back and we know the home for like something great, and we get to the show, and then it's like so it's just there's it's really hard, you know, to, to do that. Um yeah, so it's it's um I mean it's it, you can see it in that context, like why Alexandropo is so important from these communities' perspective, because it's not just like a model of education that really lifts up their cultural reality, but it's one that tries to like keep people and not keep them in the community, but like create the context in which it's a viable possibility to live in. Mm -hmm. yes. um, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah. Um, uh, so I work in um, education policy cool. and um, I, I've done a fair amount of work with um, governments in Latin America. And I, I, I think at heart, I agree with everything you're saying, but I also am curious about like knowing more about the other perspective. Yeah. Um, and in particular, what are the driving, at least explicit, arguments that the government is making? Um, you know, um, I, I um, had a class grant last year, too, and referred to the indigenous communities in Mexico. And, um, you know, these are contexts of severe resource constraints, right? And oftentimes, the quality of schools in these rural areas can be very low. And at least what I found in my field work is that there's a variety of opinions about that, even amongst the state, like the, the families and community members, that some folks feel like, why is it that we have this school that's so under-resourced? Why can't we have a, and, and I just wonder to what extent, I'm not saying this is, that what they're doing is good. I mean, like yeah. the, the closure of 80% of rural schools is really extreme, yeah. absolutely, but I can understand that potentially there's an argument there that um, these state schools do not have enough funding to fund, to have viable um, rural schools in all these communities. And so they're trying to resource up certain hub schools, and then they're trying to provide transportation to get kids to those schools. So I can see it as a viable like, policy choice that they're trying to make for that reason. And, I, and so I wanted to hear a little bit about that and then also about like, yeah, what are the sort of um, social or political values that are also undergirding those decisions? Because it, it, I wouldn't be surprised if there's values about like modernization, yeah, yeah. you know, like we want to have more, we want to give um, kids growing up in rural communities more opportunities. I'm not saying that necessarily does that, but if you concentrate kids into schools with more resources, um, you know, there's probably an argument to be made for that, that you're providing more choices. So, so just to say, like, I'd be curious to hear more about that. And also, like, you know, in some ways, I think it'll strengthen your argument to be able to, like, counter the, yeah. you know, what's what's being said by by um, government institutions. Definitely. No, I mean, that, that's, that's the thing. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Like, the logic makes sense. I mean, you just have to educate, uh, like, education administrators and, like, you know, government officials. It's, it's very much like this. Like, what would you do? You've got, like, these you know, schools that are often in like these fazendas and they used to be like the schools would basically serve like the the children of the land workers or whatever that were on these large farms. And so you might have like one small school for like the people that would work on this farm. Well that farm has been like bought out and it's transformed. It used to be like, you know, a bunch of people working there and now it's like that one tractor, you know, or that one, you know, eucalyptus machine. And so we don't even have the workers anymore. And so there's no way we can keep the school. I mean, like, why would you keep the school? Because there's no one that lives here, right? And so, like, I think the, the logic makes sense, um, undoubtedly. What's missing, though, like, 
we can imagine like the context, right? And that's going to look different in different, in different contexts, right? But in some cases, it's like, well, the landscape has completely been transformed by like the transformations of aggregations, right? And like we've moved away from like this one model where you have a community that worked the land and now it's like you go up to plantation, there's like no one living there, right? Like, of course, you're going to close that, that school. Um, and similarly, like as you're, as you're saying, like, the logic of busing students to some place with like greater opportunities makes a lot of sense, right? And it makes sense from like an educate like an education administrator's perspective, um, as well as just like the sheer logic of like how do you do education finance, right? Um, and so definitely it is perhaps like depicted here as a little maybe like I'm not cutting dry so much, but there's undoubtedly like this other set of optics or like ways of seeing the story, right? Um, and I think to kind of get at that though, you need to start just like asking these broader questions about like what is happening in the broader like social, political, and economic context in those kind of municipalities and communities. Like what are the transformations that are happening with agribusiness capital? What's the government's role in supporting those transformations? Um, I mean, to kind of jump over to one of the other parts of your question, like, um, there's definitely a big piece here in terms of like how education has been, been used in Brazil historically, or right? how it's been like narrated as like a force of modernization. And that's been explicitly racialized in Brazil, like in many other contexts, that like education is a pathway to an urban white modernity, right? That like we need to take kids, um, or it's, it's, we don't need to take kids, but like what we're putting up on the pedestal is like this vision of society, right? Which is like very much white. And this is, um, like David Planck's work in Brazil. Um, and you can look back at like the history of education policy in Brazil that kind of like highlights the ways in which education is seen as part of like a process of like nation building, but also a process of whitening. And so I think like those cultural politics are interwoven within a lot of this, um, sometimes implicitly um, and sometimes explicitly. And so like I had an experience in a school um, in different contexts of this research where I was like, in a science class and teacher who was like a visiting teacher wasn't part of the movement. They just basically went from community to community. They came in and they said like, you know, everyone get out like your hand lenses. We're gonna look at like, you know, some cells and stuff. And, and the student was like, we don't have hand lenses. Like we don't ha have hand lenses. And the teacher was like, Sempe, like they should be calling like some poodle or so, you know, they, you're not just landless. You're like, you're those that have nothing. And she like said this to the students and it, for me it like, Kind of epitomize this this feeling and like the kind of violence to come back to your point, Fred, from educators towards students of like that they live in this reality that's in this library that seems backwards. It's seen as like you know something for the dustbin of history. And what they need to do, you know, is to move to an urban center where they'll have you know quality resources like microscopes and so on and so forth. Right. So um, yeah, it's Texture. It's not so cut and, kind of dry, right? Thank you. That's a good question. We have time for one more question. Yeah, hey, thank you for your talk. Um, I find very important to talk about the agrarian question, especially focused on through education. And um, my question goes I don't know, especially the case of Brazil, mm -hmm. I'm new here for, for this information, but uh, for the case of uh, Mexico, it's very important the, the paper of. Uh, of the role of uh, rural schools there, mm. and there's also like some close, important closing closures. And um, I'm thinking of the case of escuelas normales, mm. which is maybe it's upper, like not kids or primary schools, but secondary schools where they form more teachers that then they go to to the rural schools or rural areas to teach. And what is the case of those? Uh, maybe if there is in Brazil a big part of where there are the schools where students go there for a long time and stay there at the school uh -huh. term, uh, part of that. And um, is that that a type of school that there is there? Or what is the state of the question of schools that form teachers that then go to the mm -hmm. rural areas mm -hmm. and how their education in terms of, you know, like presenting, um, staying in the countryside as option, as a good yeah. option or, yeah, how is that? I saw some interesting pieces there. So one thing that I didn't really emphasize is that 
The majority of the schools that are being closed are like what we call it primary schools, right. like elementary schools. And part of what's interesting about that is because in many of these communities, they don't have what we would call like a high school. They don't have Encino Medio, they don't have, they don't have like the, the secondary school. For that, they already have to go to the urban center. So this is already, you know, we're talking about like the crisis of rural school closures, but another part of the crisis is that like there still doesn't exist the education opportunities to stay in your community as like a as high school, what we call like a high school school. You have to leave. Like they don't have in many many places don't have in senior major. It's like a real struggle to get a school like that. So that's a piece of the puzzle. Um, I think the, another piece is that there are um, there are like the MST and other movements has worked to create these programs, kind of like what you're talking about for the training of teachers. And this is like a real focus of the movements is to create opportunities to train teachers who will come back to these schools and like work within this emphasis on the combo of vision. Um, and so that's. And then the idea is really like to you know to train one person a teacher who could then really kind of massify or increase like that potential of education in that context. So that's been very much like a political objective of the MST is was training teachers. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Mitch for his time. I just wanted to thank you for giving a shout out to the grant program. Uh, so we do have uh, grants for graduate students. Uh, the deadline is coming up.